Hello, I'm Michael McGuire. This is part of the AWWA Thought Leader Series, and I'm going to be talking about the history of disinfection and chlorine in particular. The purpose of this presentation is to really talk about a forgotten hero of public health and how John Leal, combined with George Warren Fuller, to conquer waterborne disease. Uh, through their efforts, through the efforts of the application of chlorine as a disinfectant, it was possible to control typhoid fever, to in fact eradicate it from the United States, and to also eliminate the horror of the diarrheal diseases which killed uh, many children at the beginning of the 20th century. But besides the history of chlorine, I'm also interested in what drives someone to greatness. Uh, Dr. John Leal's father, Dr. John Rose Leal, was a uh, volunteer in the Civil War. He was the regimental surgeon for the 144th New York Volunteer Regiment. Uh, and during the Civil War at the, um, at the siege of Charleston, South Carolina, he and the rest of the 1,000 men in his uh, regiment contracted what could only have been amoebic dysentery. That disease at that time had three outcomes. It either killed you immediately, or your body was able to fight it off, or you lived with it for the rest of your life until ultimately it killed you. And that was the fate of Dr. John Roseleal. His son saw him living with this disease for 19 years after he came back from the Civil War. And they knew that it came from contaminated drinking water. So this must have had a tremendous impact on his son. And his son changed his life and changed his career so that he could have an impact on the diseases carried by water uh, during this uh, turn of the 20th century time period. Uh, now I'm going to talk about germs, disease, and death, my favorite topic. I want you to strap yourself in your favorite time machine and join me in the 1890s. At this time, contamination of water supplies was common. Also at the same time, waterborne disease, not surprisingly, was rampant. People would get sick and die from uh, pathogens that were in drinking water because of the contamination of the water source. Sewage was, raw sewage was discharged into the local uh, water course, whatever it was, a, a, a lake or a river, uh, because the engineers at the time found it necessary to get the filth out of the cities as quickly as possible. This was based upon the miasma theory of disease, which meant that bad smells caused disease. And so to get the bad smells out of the cities, and these cities were exploding at the turn of the 20th century in the 1890s, because of the American Industrial Revolution, the waves of immigrants who came to our shores to staff all of the factories that were uh, present at the time, uh, turning out um, all manner of goods for the American economy. And this urbanization, this concentration of people into these cities made it necessary to build sewers to take the smells, the filth, if you will, out of the cities and put it somewhere. And the somewhere happened to be the, the local river or lake. And that would be fine, except that local river or lake turned out to be the water supply for somebody else. At the same time that sewer systems were being built in the United States, also we were constructing centralized water systems. Not for the purpose of providing a water supply, as most people probably think, but for the purpose of fighting fires. Well, of course, if you're providing water for firefighting, it's natural that people would want to tap into that to use it in homes and to also use it in these newfangled inventions called flush toilets. The problem is the source of supply. As I said, most cities went to the local water supply, the local water source, which was a, a river, or lake, or a creek. Um, the engineers at the time said, oh no, you shouldn't do that. You should go to an upland supply where it's, the water is pure, where you can um, not be concerned about contamination. They knew about contamination and they knew it was causing problems. 
But the problem was there weren't enough of these upland su uh, supplies, and many of them were so far away that it made it impossible from an economic perspective to develop them. And so what we created, we, our industry, our profession, created a very efficient disease delivery system. In effect, we created what I call the sewer pipe, water pipe death spiral, where at the top of a river system, uh, water would be clean and pure, people would take it out in a, maybe a small village, but then they would put their sewage right back into that water supply, and the people down, downstream would then have to deal with the fact that there was a contaminated source and so on down a river system until uh, you get to the bottom when the, the river was obviously too contaminated for use, but in fact it was used as a water supply. These were accepted facts of daily life within uh, the American uh, urban system and within the profession of engineers at the time. There were early disinfection examples that Dr. John Leal, who I'm going to talk about most, mostly in this uh, presentation, could turn to uh, to get an idea of what might be possible from the point of view of disinfecting a water supply. The most important effect on the use of chlorine in the United States was in Lincoln, England in 1905. There was, again, there was a typhoid fever epidemic. <clears throat> Uh, hundreds of people were sickened, uh, 125 died, and at the time they called in, in the middle of the epidemic, they knew they were having a serious problem, they called in an expert from London, and Dr. Houston decided that this would be a good opportunity to um, use a chemical disinfectant as a trial. This is a different situation from the others because there was treatment on the water supply, a slow sand filter which was being used throughout uh, England and, the, well, the rest of the UK, frankly, for uh, protection against contaminated water supplies. But as we know today, slow sand filters are not uh, a complete protection, and in fact, in this particular case, it was being operated improperly and people were getting sick and dying. Uh, typhoid bacilli were pushing right through the filters and getting into the distribution system. So he set up a feed of sodium hypochlorite that ultimately was producing about one part per million as a dosage, and that ran from 1905 until 1911 when they changed their water supply. <clears throat> At the time, the professionals, uh, folks like us, who were running water supplies and engineers and academics who were studying uh, waterborne disease and other aspects of drinking water quality, were against the use of chemical disinfectants in the United States. They believed that any chemical disinfectant was a poison. And the addition of that to drinking water, even though it might have a beneficial effect, would be worse than the problem it was trying to solve. Doc, uh, Dr. George C. Whipple presented a paper at the 1906 AWWA conference in Boston where he explored the possibility of using uh, chemical disinfectants, particularly chlorine, as a way of purifying water. He was not in favor of it, as you can see from the quotes on, on the slide. But he was exploring the possibility that we should, that we, the profession, should consider it and make, make some investigations, perhaps, into seeing if this was a way that we should go. The audience was not pleased. Even considering this and talking about it in public, resulted in an attack on Whipple. Uh, here are some quotes. Uh, one professor, uh, William Mason, who ended up being a, pr a president of AWWA, talked about it as something that shouldn't be considered now, but maybe in the future, and reflected the view that the public would not be accepting of such a use of a chemical disinfectant. Uh, I like the quote best from Mr. Magnan, uh, who was in the audience, and they, by the way, they took these comments down by a court reporter, and they're preserved for all of us to see many, many years later. Uh, all these substances, including chlorine, are poisonous. Such poisonous materials should not be permitted to be used on water intended for public supplies. That, in essence, was the, the point of view of water professionals at the time. Enter Dr. John Leal. He was born in a small town, rural town in New York State, 
As I mentioned, his father served as a surgeon in the Civil War. The Leal family moved to Patterson, New Jersey, which is in northern New Jersey, uh, in 1867 after the Civil War. When John Leal finished his medical school, he came back to Patterson, New Jersey, opened up a private practice, became associated with the hospitals, and then um, started to work for the city itself in various positions. He was appointed the Patterson City Physician in 1886. And most importantly, he became the Patterson Public Health Officer in 1892 and held that position until almost the turn of the century. Next, I want to talk about the Jersey City water supply because that is a main character in this story. Jersey City uh, began as a very small village and ultimately grew into um, a, a city of over 300,000 people. During this time period, it had different uh, sources of supply that ultimately became contaminated. As most cities in the United States um, developed a water supply, they first had shallow wells in, this, in the actual city itself. And those become, became contaminated, and the city fathers and, and government decided to go outside of the city and try to find a purer water supply. Well, they chose uh, the Patterson uh, Passaic River at Belleville, uh, which unfortunately was just downstream of Patterson, New Jersey, and as I've said, that was an exploding uh, industrial town. It wasn't very long before that water supply became highly contaminated. The typhoid fever rates in Jersey City were phenomenal. Very high, a lot of people died as a result of contaminated water. In 1895, Jersey City contracted with a private water company to get a temporary water supply but four years later, they signed a contract with someone who we would today call an entrepreneur, uh, Patrick Flynn. Uh, Patrick Flynn developed a contract with the city to provide a new water supply, brand new water supply. Most importantly, in the contract language, it had to be pure and wholesome. Now, pure and wholesome is a phrase that was used in a lot of contracts in uh, English uh, uh, water supply history. Uh, it's part of English common law. And it had been in other contracts in the United States, but it was never enforced or, shall we say, argued to the extent that it was in Jersey City, which we'll see in a minute. Ultimately, our uh, entrepreneur, Patrick Flynn, went out of business, became bankrupt. But the contract that he did uh, sign with the city was assigned to a private water company called the Jersey City Water Supply Company, in fact, the company that Dr. John Leal worked for. And Dr. John Leal's, uh, what he had to do for the company was to eliminate sources of contamination in the watershed for this new uh, water supply, which was located on the Rockaway River, an up, uh, upland uh, tributary to the Passaic River, a relatively clean water supply. And he would go throughout the watershed, literally walking it uh, by horseback, uh, looking for privies, particularly privies that were dumping their contents directly into the stream. This was not unusual uh, at the turn of the 20th century in the United States, and it's certainly not unusual in developing countries today. The water supply was completed in 1904. The city, under the terms of the contract, had to pay the private water company that developed this $7.6 million. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but, but of course, that was, those were in 1904 dollars. Today, that would be about $175 million, so a fairly significant amount of money. The water supply that they built was a dam called Booten Dam, which backed up a reservoir of 7 billion gallons called Booten Reservoir and a 22-mile pipeline that took this water supply without any treatment from the dam to Jersey City. The problem is that the city apparently did not want to pay the full price for this water supply. And, was common as, and as was common in New Jersey at the time, if you didn't like the uh, way a contract was written, you would sue the other party. And that's what happened after a report from a consultant, again, 
uh, Dr. George Whipple, came in and wrote a report on the water supply from Booten Dam. At this time, the science of bacteriology was exploding. We were developing the tools uh, that we currently use today. There was a, a rudimentary technique for a total plate count and the, one of the beginnings of an analytical method for total coliforms. He used these methods to analyze the water and not surprisingly he found bacteria. <clears throat> he wrote a report and from that report these concerns were raised and the city sued the private water company. All of the things that I'm going to talk about after, after all of this, after the beginning of this lawsuit, was essentially a contract dispute. The central question was, was the water supply being served to Jersey City pure and wholesome? A judge was assigned to this, um, and the uh, testimony was held uh, over a period of many months uh, in fact, 3,000 pages of testimony for the first trial. There were experts on both sides. This is a uh, graphic of uh, Booten Reservoir. You can see it sort of looks like a, a cucumber. Um, the water supply entered at the top left uh, from the Rockaway River, and the dam is on the top right. Not surprisingly, when there was a large rainstorm in the watershed, there was short circuiting across that reservoir and contaminated water from uh, the river moved right across into the uh, outlet of the dam. Now reservoirs at this time were known to do some purification of water. There was sedimentation and predation by other organisms that would uh, in effect lower the bacteria count, but certainly not under the conditions of a storm system. As part of this first trial, then the judge issued a final decree and in effect found for the, uh, the contractor, the private water company, that the city had to pay them. But the amount of uh, money that would be required to put in sanitary sewers to remove this problem uh, that is not providing a pure and wholesome water, that could be deducted from the contract amount. And so the private water company was obviously not happy about this, and Dr. John Leal saw this as an opportunity. He was able to get language inserted into this final decree, which says, the defendant company may, within 90 days from the date hereof, present, quote, other plans or devices, unquote, for maintaining the purity of the water delivered by the company. Now, we know that he inserted these, these words into the final decree that was written by a judge, interestingly enough, because there was testimony to this effect in the second trial. And indeed, a second trial was held to determine what these other plans or devices might be and how uh, they would affect uh, the health of the people who were receiving the water. Was, in fact, what they were proposing safe? Leo thought that chlorine was a solution. He had been working with chlorine in a variety of forms uh, his whole career. Uh, very strong solutions of chloride of lime, which is the form of chlorine that was available, were used to wash down the walls and surfaces in a house where a communicable disease occurred. Uh, at that time, this was also part of the miasma theory of disease, that if you could use this strong smelling chlorine solution, you could get rid of the emanations, the, the miasma, the odors that might cause this kind of a disease. But he also took a more scientific approach, and in the late 1890s, as he testified to in the trial, he conducted laboratory experiments where he convinced himself that very low concentrations of chlorine could, in fact, kill the bacteria that were being found in the water and ultimately kill the bacteria that were responsible for these dread diseases of typhoid fever and other uh, diarrheal diseases that were prevalent at the time. And as you can see from the quotes on the slide, it was his decision, once he realized that the judge was going to find that the water was contaminated, it was his decision to move forward with the testing on a full scale of the use of chlorine for disinfection. And he hired George Warren Fuller. 
Now, many of you have heard that name before because it's, he has an award named after him in AWWA. He was a giant at the time. Many people know him for his expertise in filtration. Uh, he was probably the most famous sanitary engineer of his day. And his day lasted a long time, from the late 1890s up until 1934 when he died. Leal um, probably took a ferry across the Hudson River and marched to his office at 170 Broadway and presented him with a proposal. And that proposal was, I have a, a water supply problem and I think I have a solution, but I need an engineer to design a way to add the chlorine to the water. Will you do it? The answer was obviously yes. The bad news was that it had to be done very quickly. And indeed, it was required that to meet the requirements of the court decision, that they had to do this within 99 days. Now just think about that for a second. This is a type of water treatment that had never been done before, particularly on this, this scale. We're talking about 40 million gallons per day, uh, never done in the United States, uh, using a source of chlorine that was uh, difficult to handle. Um, the only source was a, a powder form that we know is calcium hypochloride today, they called it chloride of lime. And just to emphasize, the chlorine dose that was being used here was very low. In many ways, Dr. Leal was lucky because the chlorine demand of the water from the Rockaway River and Booton Reservoir were, was quite low, so that he could use uh, this small dosage and not create much of a taste and odor problem while still affecting a good bacterial kill at a very, very high flow of 40 mgd. And so it was a very simple um, gravity feed system for a concentrated solution of dissolved calcium hypochlorite. And it worked. Surprisingly, even surprisingly today, I guess, is the best way to describe it, there was no method for measuring a chlorine residual. Uh, it just didn't exist. That came years later. All they could rely upon was the amount of chlorine that they were putting into the water, in effect, the chlorine dose. This is a photograph of uh, the, what was called the sterilization plant at Booton Reservoir. You can see the dam, Booton Dam on the, the left, uh, moving from left to right. In the middle of the photograph is the gatehouse, which contained all the valves for the pipes leading from the dam. That is still there today. But the project was built and started on time. September 26, 1908, chlorine was added for the first time to the Jersey City water supply and has been added ever since. Jersey City has the longest period of record of disinfection of any city in the world. There was a second trial. The special master again listened to experts on both sides. There were approximately 15 experts on each side. The uh, trial took many months and again, about 3,000 pages of testimony. And in his decision, he approved the application of chloride of lime as meeting this requirement of other plans or devices for essentially causing the water to become pure and wholesome. In 1910, the New Jersey Supreme Court sustained the special master's findings, and the use of chlorine exploded across the United States after that. The reason is, is that everybody, when I say everybody, the profession, the water profession, was finally getting pretty embarrassed and pretty sick and tired of the fact that they were serving contaminated water to people and folks were getting sick. They were looking for a solution, but they needed an official stamp of approval that would make it possible for them to add chlorine to the water supply without getting sued or without people complaining and uh, causing problems for them with maybe the city government. This is a graph of the decrease in the typhoid fever death rate uh, from about 1900 until the 1950s, uh, I think it is. What it shows is the impact of the chlorination, the disinfection of drinking water supplies in the United States. Uh, filtration was also coming to the fore at this time, but it's quite clear that without disinfection, filtration would not have had as great an impact as it, as it did, as it's shown here. What's really significant from our, for the point of view of our discussion is the rapid penetration of this technology into the drinking water community at the time. 
Uh, 21 million people by 1914, just four years after the judges, uh, the Supreme Court's decision in New Jersey, 21 million people were being served chlorinated water. Four years later, 33 million people were being served chlorinated water. This was almost three quarters of the municipal served water in the United States. Just think about that for a second. A technology that changed water treatment literally in a few years. Life magazine, of course, um, cited filtration and chlorination of drinking water as probably the most significant public health advance in the millennium. Not in the century, in the millennium. But I think what most professionals in the water business should be uh, proud of is the fact that we stopped killing young children by the hundreds of thousands. In the United States, at the turn of the century, there were death rates for young children under the age of one year that were horrific. In some cities, 20 to 30 percent. Think about what that means. One in every five children to one in every three children that were born died before the age of one year. Something that would certainly be unacceptable today in this country, but unfortunately is the case in some developing countries. As you can see from the slide, that death rate dramatically decreased over time. And it was only through the application of clean water uh, to these drinking water systems and its use in producing safe milk that it made it possible that this death rate was dramatically uh, curtailed. And as a result, we started living longer. This is an shows an increase in the uh, average uh, uh, age of uh, 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 people living in the United States. It started out at 47 years of age in 1900, and today it's about 79 years of age on average. Uh, Scientific American in 2007 called chlorination one of the great inventions of the 20th century, and certainly as a result of this increase uh, in longevity, uh, it's due in many, many ways to, um, not, to the chlorination of drinking water and the filtration and treatment of drinking water. Uh, I'm always fond of saying if you've lived past the age of 47 years, uh, don't thank a doctor, thank an engineer. I became very interested in the life of Dr. John Leal. Um, I did a lot of research on his life and his genealogy, uh, and I went looking for his, his grave. Uh, I knew he was buried in Patterson, but I didn't know where. So I went to the largest cemetery, Cedar Lawn Cemetery, and just walked up to the desk and asked, if they had a Dr. John Leal buried there. And the guy looked up in his, his uh, records and said, yes, we have a Leal family plot and there is a John L. Leal buried there. And he gave me a map um, that showed how to get to the, the gravesite and I drove up to the top of the, of the hill where the gravesite was located and saw that uh, John Leal was buried with no marker whatsoever, no gravestone, uh, nothing. It was uh, simply a bare piece of ground. I thought that that was something that needed to be corrected, and I worked with the New Jersey AWWA section and the descendants of Dr. John Leal to erect a monument uh, in his honor. And on that monument, it calls, it lays out all the members of the family that are buried there, and Dr. John Leal calling him a hero of public health, which certainly he was. There was a dedication ceremony um, held on May 5th, 2013, um, and that monument will be there hopefully for a very long time to uh, recognize the contribution that Dr. John Leal made to public health in this country. I'm convinced that the chlorination of uh, the water from Boonton Reservoir only occurred because of the, the, the uh, interaction and partnership between the two men, Dr. John Leal and George Warren Fuller. Leal had the courage and the foresight to make it happen. But Fuller had the engineering expertise. Fuller would never have put chlorine in that water supply on his own. Engineers were simply too conservative. They just wouldn't do it. But together, they made it happen. And the amazing thing is they did it in 99 days and it worked flawlessly from the beginning. I wrote a book about this, um, The Chlorine Revolution. Uh, it was published by AWWA in April of 2013 and it talks about all of the issues of public health of the day and the revolution that John Leal caused by introducing chlorine into the Jersey City water supply.